I had last left you in part five of the Beach Boys with the release of Surf's Up. And this is where the Beach Boys reclaimed some commercial success and critical success as well. And this is what they were looking for. They released two of the best songs from the album as singles, that being Cool Cool Water and Surf's Up, and both of those songs bombed. So I guess they legitimately were an album-oriented rock band, which is what they were looking to be. Now, by 1971, most 60s bands had bottomed out and the Beach Boys were kind of limping across the finish line here in 71. And they, like a lot of other bands that stuck around, had to up their game, and per particularly on the live front. So they added two new players to the band, Ricky Fatar and Blondie Chaplin. Now these guys were from the group The Flames, and this band had opened for the Beach Boys in 1970 and 71. And they were a South African band, so Chaplin and Fatar were asked to join the band, adding some much needed color to their sound. And Fatar was a shoe in because Dennis Wilson had broken his hand. He had punched through a, a plate glass window in a drunken escapade, and he was not able to play the drums for quite a while. So that moved him to the front line and Fatar on drums. So this lineup was a really strong live lineup, actually. Other additions to their live band was Captain and Tennille, so that's Daryl Dragon and Tony Tennille, plus Billy Hinchy. Now, Hinchy had been asked to join back in 69 and declined. Well, he was added to the touring band at this time. This is how they went into recording their next album called Carl and the Passion So Tough. These songs are okay, but they're far from their best work. And uh, Marcella was a co write with Brian Wilson and Tandon Elmer, who he was hanging around with a lot at the time. And Dennis was now writing with Daryl Dragon, and he came up with two kind of sappy ballads. Even newcomers Fatar and Chaplin chipped in a couple of originals. The song Here She Comes sounds a little bit like the Atlanta Rhythm section to me, and the next song I played, Hold On To Your Brother, that song reminds me a little bit of CSNY. Now, these songs are really good songs, but the problem is, is they don't sound that much like the Beach Boys, unlike this next song. Carl and the Passions, So Tough, was released in 1972, and it only made it up to number 50 on the U.S. charts, number 25 in the U.K. And the title, uh, which is strange because the title doesn't mention the Beach Boys, but Carl and the Passions was apparently an early name for the Beach Boys before they were the Beach Boys, although I couldn't quite confirm that. And the So Tough thing is, it's, Carl had taken over the band pretty much at this point, and that reflects the direction the band was going. Now, this album, to me, always sounded disjointed. It was recorded in between touring, multiple studios. It didn't have a lot of direction. And uh, they confused fans even further by adding a second disc to the album. So this became a double album, and the second disc that was added was Pet Sounds. Now, what makes this kind of strange is that they've been trying to get away from their old sound and their old image for so long, and adding this this to it seems to go against what they were trying to do. Now, music journalist Peter Dogg had stated that the bonus record was originally intended to be Smile. Now, if you remember from the previous video, when Warner Brothers signed the Beach Boys to this record contract, they wanted the Beach Boys to produce Smile. That was part of the deal. And uh, Brian Wilson apparently didn't want to do this. <laughs> and when he got involved, they ended up according to Doggett, substituting pet sounds instead of a finished smile. But in London, in February of 72, they announced that Smile would be released imminently, and obviously that did not happen. By the time this album came out, they had already been with Warner Brothers for a couple of years, and one of the stipulations to signing with Warner Brothers was producing a finished smile. And they were paid $50,000 up front as a part of that deal. And since it was never delivered, the Beach Boys at this point had to pay that money back, which was bad timing because they weren't flush with cash. They're trying to get back on track here. And it seems like they just kept making 
misstep after misstep, even after they had a couple of Pyrrhic victories, uh, making these decisions without really any confidence or any really rationale. So there's no wonder why this album sounds disjointed and doesn't, it's not one of the more popular albums and not really sought after that much. First of all, I mean, I, I never could understand why they wouldn't mention the name Beach Boys on the cover. That's always going to hurt a band, especially if they're trying to recapture new audiences. So on the CD that was released many years later, that did have the Beach Boys name on the cover. Now, one of the things fans didn't like, they didn't care for the additions of Chaplin and Fatar. Uh, I think that they didn't like them taking time or vocals away from the regular band members. And that was one thing that kind of disenfranchised their fan base a bit. Making matters worse, the band was barely speaking to each other at this point. They would often travel separately, and uh, Brian Wilson had kind of retreated from the band. The only person he was really working with during this time was Tandon Almer, and they were working on songs for his wife and sister-in-law's band, American Spring. And Dennis was either getting fired or quitting. He was just in and out and working on some solo stuff during this period, and his dedication was not where it had been in the past. And Mike Love even considered quitting to take on uh, Transcendental Meditation, becoming a teacher full time. So all that was going on. And, you know, it makes me think, well, maybe they should have packed it in after Surf's Up. Adding to the dysfunction, um, Bruce Johnston was fired during, the, the, during this album. Fired slash quit. Jack Riley, the manager, and Johnston got into a big fight. And Johnston was gone after that. So... The Wilson brothers were not agreeing much with Johnston. Johnston wasn't into the drug scene at all, so he was a bit, you know, on another plane from those guys. And he didn't care for the fact that Brian Wilson wasn't really participating much. So that's why he was in it. You know, Mike Love said it was an amicable firing or him leaving or whatever, so I guess it was okay. With the band at its most unstable, they pushed forward to record their next album. And they wanted to get away from the L.A. scene, so they thought they would record abroad. And since they were always somewhat beholden to a lot of their European fans, in particular their Dutch fans, they decided to record in Amsterdam. Now, this was a logistical nightmare. Four tons of gear had to be shipped there. They shipped their families over, including girlfriends and dogs. There was a housing shortage, actually, at the time, so they didn't research this very well. So finding accommodations in which to live became an issue. So they ended up occupying 11 different homes, and a renovated barn was outfitted for a studio. And uh, they shipped their own equipment in, and this whole cost was $250,000. And it took three attempts to get Brian on the plane to even go. So he... He was not a willing participant. He, I think he liked he, the safety of his own home, obviously, his bedroom. Another thing, Dennis hardly participated in it. He didn't like being there at all. I don't think he stayed very long. Outfitting this studio in a barn was not easy, and it was not functioning for a long time. So a guy, engineer Steve Moffat, spent 18 hours a day for almost five weeks trying to get this thing up and running. And because of the delays, this messed up their touring schedule. Now, the touring schedule that they had... Uh, worked in with the recording of this album was going to help pay for all these accommodations and for the shipping of all this. So some of those tour dates had to be canceled because they just weren't ready to even go to Europe. And that hurt them financially as well. Now, as I said, Dennis didn't record very much. He wasn't very interested. Brian also didn't record very much. He stayed in his, his home, his rented home. He was drinking a lot, and he even uh, totaled a Mercedes, wrapped it around a tree, but he was completely unharmed. So luckily for that. But after two and a half months, they only had some basic tracks recorded, and they had to go home. And uh, Jack Riley, the manager, stayed in Amsterdam and decided to manage the band from there. So the album in question is called, as you might guess, Holland. And... Uh, Unfortunately, when they recorded it and submitted it to Warners, Warners rejected it. They were not, they didn't think it was good enough. They uh, were still a little bit peeved from this whole smile debacle. They really expected that to be delivered and believed in it. So things were frosted between the two. And this album really didn't have a hit single on it from what they could hear. So that's one of the reasons why they had them go back to the drawing board. But help arrived in the form of Van Dyke Parks. Now, Van Dyke Parks was the one that helped get them signed to Warner Brothers. He worked for Warner Brothers, and they encouraged him to get involved writing with Brian again to try to rekindle some of the magic. And one of the songs they had worked on was a song called Sail on Sailor. Unlighted. 
I think Sail on Sailor is one of the best singles of the entire decade of the 70s. I think it's on par with Elton John's work at this point. It doesn't sound a whole lot like the Beach Boys. Blondie Chaplin is the guy singing lead on it. Does a great job. It sounds much more soulful, which I think the Beach Boys really needed in their sound. But unfortunately, this single only got to number 79. And it was re-released about a year later and got up to 49. So that's... Not great, but not bad. <laughs> and uh, this track had a bit of a complicated history. It had uh, not only Van Dyke Parks and Brian Wilson writing, but Tandon Elmer, Jack Riley, and Ray Kennedy also contributed to the song. Holland was released in 1973, and this was very much led by Jack Riley, the manager. And as you saw with the, uh, the previous album, he was a very hands-on manager. I think maybe a little too handsy, but... Um, he, it was his idea partially to go to Holland and, you know, he's involved in some of the writing and, and some of the production on this record. And he does some of the recitation again, which he did on the previous album, which I don't particularly care for. But uh, there's still some pretty quality, good quality songs on this record. A man my adventure, a horse drawn stage from Monterey. Funky Pretty captures that soul sound some more, and that's one of the better tracks on the album. And We Got Love was written by Blondie Chaplin, Ricky Futaur, and Mike Love. And that's also a real good song. So this album is, I think it's a pretty good album. It's considered probably the band's last great album. And it is a little patchy in spots. But I would say, the, based on what they had to go through to record it, I think it sounds pretty darn good. Now, it only got to number 36 in the United States and number 20 in the UK. Now, much like the prior album, Carl and the Passion So Tough, where they added a second disc, which was Pet Sounds, they added a second disc for this album as well, but this was an EP, and this was called Mount Vernon and Fairway. And this was a Brian Wilson kind of little project that he was trying to make into the whole album, but the band didn't want that, nor did the lit record label. And it's the story of a Pied Piper who lives inside a glowing transistor radio owned by a family of royalty. So it's very fairy tale like and there's some reciting by guess who Jack Riley. Now I don't have this EP. I just have a used copy here and didn't come with that. But uh, in an odd move there was a little booklet that came with it and here's what they said. They called it a post Sartre essay on the nothingness of being. It is not a rock opera, so it will disappoint some and insult perhaps a few listeners. Now, why would you say that in your album? <laughs> I mean, this is just par for the course for this band, not understanding PR at all. So, you know, one of the things, Brian Wilson was further going off track here, and the band was trying to keep him out of the studio at this point. I stayed in my room for about three and a half years. I was taking some drugs, you know, and I experimented and I experimented myself right out of action. That was really what life was all about for me, you know, staying in bed. I mean, I was hiding away from everything and anything, and it was just one big hideaway. I would say this album was a bit of an acquired taste, and the critics were very kind to this album. So uh, I think that was, in spite of the difficulty in recording this, I'm kind of surprised they came up with such a good album. But nonetheless, I mean, it, it sold all right and obviously good reviews, but there was fallout after this. They ended up firing Jack Riley. Apparently him managing from Amsterdam wasn't going to work. And his idea of even going to Amsterdam, that pretty much backfired on them. And uh, Ricky Vitar and Blondie Chaplin left not long after this. In June of 1973, uh, the Wilson brothers' father died. Murray passed away. And this sent Brian into deeper depression and even suicidal thoughts, and he was in getting in worse shape. And he even started hearing Phil Spector's voice and his father's voice in his head. So this is how he entered 1973, and he started to medicate with more drinking and more drugs. Now this seems like the end of the road for the band, and if uh, 
you know, we were looking at it objectively maybe in 1973. I don't think anybody would have been surprised if the band packed it in now. But the band hired a new manager. They hired Jim Gersio. Now, Gersio managed Chicago. They were a very hot band at the time. But something very strange happened that had nothing to do with the band, and that was the release of a movie called American Graffiti. And this movie was released in 1973, and it was a surprise hit. It was only made for $700,000 and made like $140 million. And it's a coming-of-age story set in 1962. So this was the beginning of a whole surge in 1950s nostalgia. You know, you had uh, Happy Days and Sha Na Na and Grease, and all this stuff started coming back. They were tired of the 60s, tired of that hippie stuff, and they wanted something wholesome again. The American Graffiti album hit number 10 on the charts, was a huge seller, and the soundtrack had 41 songs on it and two were Beach Boy songs. And the only three songs from the 60s were the two Beach Boy songs and Green Onions by Booker T and the MGs. The rest of the songs were all 50s. So we see the Beach Boys getting lumped into this 1950s era of rock and roll. And that was an era they were trying to always escape from. But what happened was there was a resurgence in their music. And this ended up helping their concert attraction a great deal. And they released a live album at the end of the year in November, The Beach Boys in Concert. And this went to number 25. This was their biggest hit album in a number of years, and their first gold album since Pet Sounds. Capitol realized that they had something on their hands here. Now, Capitol controlled the pre-1966 Beach Boys catalog. And in 1973, the Beatles had the Red and the Blue albums, which were huge successes. So Capitol did the same thing again with the Beach Boys a year later in 1974 and released Endless Summer, which is this album right here. This album went to number one, was three times platinum, and Rolling Stone named them Band of the Year. So they were firing on all cil cylinders in their live program, and they continued to add more and more oldies to their act. So this sold really well and brought them a whole new legion of fans. Now this album was 1974. So in 1975, they released a second double album called Spirit of America, much like the same, same pre-1966 stuff, very 50s, old photos. This went to number eight. So this was also a big hit. So the live album, The Beach Boys in Concert in 1973, this in 74, and Spirit of America in 75 were three of their biggest selling albums of their careers. So after trying to change their image for so many years and getting away from that surf image and that pre-Beatles image, they had come full circle and they were starting to embrace that image now that it was making them some money. So they were starting to tour with, like I said, Chicago, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, some of the big, the big touring bands at the time, and people just ate it up. So it was a great combination for those, those newer bands that were having so much success as well. Now, despite all the oldies, there was one classic written by one of the Beach Boys during this period, and that's a song called You Are So Beautiful. You are so beautiful. And this was a song that Dennis Wilson co-wrote or contributed to Billy Preston's song that he had started, but was not credited for, and they worked on this at a party. And this became one of Dennis's concert staples. Here we have the band at their most prosperous in such a long time. And they're very popular. They're making all kinds of money on the road. The records are selling. The back catalog is starting to sell. And Brian is declining. So this is what's called his, his bathrobe bedroom period, where he, he didn't come out of his bedroom a lot. It's not true that he didn't ever come out, because he did. In fact, he used to go to some parties. And one of his buddies was still Danny Hutton, if you remember him from hanging around in the Smile Sessions. Well, by 1974, Danny Hutton was flush with Three Dog Night money. They were huge stars. And Brian would go over to Danny, Danny Hutton's house and join the party. Now, Brian was indulging in cocaine, heroin, drinking, overeating, over everything. And uh, oftentimes Marilyn would have to send friends over to get him out of the party and they had to climb the fence at Danny Hutton's house to retrieve Brian Wilson. So Brian started hanging out with some of the big partiers at that time, some of those like Hollywood vampire types like Keith Moon, Iggy Pop, Ringo Starr, Alice Cooper. That was probably not the best place for him and he was acting strangely even at these parties and some of these people would tell of some of the strange behavior. He was photographed at Keith Moon's 28th birthday party wearing only his bathrobe, so that he was going to the party in his robe. And uh, wearing slippers and a bathrobe, he jumped on stage at the Troubadour, interrupting jazz musician Larry Coryell and sang Bebop Alula. 
So occasionally Wilson would also wander the city and uh, would kind of run away. And he would beg for rides and drugs and alcohol. And one time he, he hitchhiked and was picked up by Merv Griffin, who took him home. So he was also drinking and driving. He crashed several cars at this time. So he was really in bad shape. And he was uh, just running amok, basically. So at this point, they installed Brian's cousin Stan Love to come in and basically be his caretaker, trainer, and um, you know, basically to keep him away from drugs. That was the thing. Now, Stan Love, who was, he was kind of a health nut. He was an NBA player. He played, at this point, he was with the LA Lakers. He played about five years in the NBA and the ABA. But unfortunately, after a number of months, Stan had to go back and play ball. And then Brian, who was making some progress under Stan's care, fell back into destructive behavior. So by late 1975, Marilyn, his wife, had had him seeing, he had seen over 20 different therapists and nobody seemed to be able to really help him. And she found a guy, he was kind of a, I guess you'd say, psychiatrist at the stars. This was Dr. Eugene Landy. He had done some work with Rod Steiger, Alice Cooper, and he was also a consultant on the Bob Newhart show. But what Landy would do to keep Brian away from all these, indulging in all these drugs, is he had 24-hour supervision on him. Locks on the refrigerator, constant supervision. He kept him off drugs, and he made him diet and exercise. And he forced him out of bed and into the recording studio with the Beach Boys. So initially, this, the installation of Landy, who was not cheap, this started to work. So the next album they started working on, the Beach Boys 15 Big Ones. And this was another ill-conceived PR campaign was started, and that was called Brian's Back. And Landy had encouraged him to record in the studio. And this led to Brian being instilled back on the road and, and touring with the Beach Boys, which he probably wasn't quite ready for yet. But anyway, this album, what they were going to do, Brian wanted to do an album of all oldies. And the band said, no way, we don't want to do all oldies. So they did half and half. And obviously, with the success of these other albums here, these uh, retrospective albums, the oldies here basically fit into what they were doing. And one of the singles from this period was rock and roll music. Just let me hear some of that rock and roll music. Any old way you choose it. Believe it or not, a cover that terrible actually made it to number five on the charts. So the Beach Boys could really do no wrong at this point. But under Landy's care, uh, things were not all rosy. I mean, he Brian was getting back on track, but Landy was starting to assert control even in the studio. Now, after the band compromised with Brian of doing half originals and half oldies, the Brian did join them on the road, but and he was playing bass and or piano. And the problem was, is occasionally he would suffer a panic attack. He wasn't quite ready to do the, do the road thing yet, so this Brian's back was not completely true. He did produce this album solely, which uh, is unusual, but uh, he, he got it together and was able to produce it. So that part was good, but the road was still troublesome for him. And Billy Hinchy even said that sometimes Brian would be playing a completely different song than them. And so, obviously, he was still not well. So 15 Big Ones did pretty well on the charts. Got to number 8 in the U.S., number 31 in the U.K., and it was just riding that wave of old nostalgia. Now, the next album was called The Beach Boys Love You. Now, this was originally supposed to be Brian Wilson Loves You. It was mostly composed by Brian, but on this album, you can hear his voice starting to give way a little bit. He had a four-pack-a-day habit, and his voice started to betray him a bit here. Here's what he said about recording The Beach Boys Love You. That's when it all happened for me. That's where my heart lies. Love You is the best album we ever made. He said that in 1998. Now, later on, Brian's quotes about some of these albums, I, I don't agree with that. <laughs> you know, I think he did better work, but that's where his mind was at. He was really into this album, and um, they were trying to get him, uh, to give him some leeway to record and to create again. This album, released in 1977, only got to number 53 in the charts, but it did a little better in the UK at number 28. Now this album to me is for completists only. It's pleasant and I guess inoffensive, but they were musically irrelevant at this point and essentially a nostalgia act. And Brian was still trying to create, but 
I mean, everybody has their time, and his time had passed. Now, he was trying to write his own album and started working on something called Adult Child. And this was at the insistence of Landy. Landy, that was a term that Landy came up with to describe Brian as an adult child. And this was this consisted of some early tra earlier tracks he worked on. Al and Mike are not on much of this, these recordings. They were working on other projects, and Dennis was working on a solo project. So the, the, the band didn't feel like this was enough of a band effort to release as an album, and so they retooled it and went back to the drawing board. Now, projects like Adult Child was encouraged by Landy, and he was starting to uh, wear out his welcome. His bill monthly was in the $30,000 range, and he got fired because it looked like he was putting his thumb on the scale here and overcharging Brian, and um, they fired him. So in, in lieu of, of him, they brought in cousin Stan Love and Steve Cordoff, and they were supervising Brian. And Marilyn hired these guys, and they were going to hopefully continue Brian's workout regimen and keep him away from drugs. Now, meanwhile, Dennis was recording a solo album called Pacific Ocean Blue. Pacific Ocean Blue only got to number 96 in the charts, but it outperformed the next two Beach Boys album. It's considered somewhat of a classic. And the title song was co-written by Mike Love. And even though these band members like Mike Love and Dennis were always feuding, there was fights on stage, but they always seemed to come back together and be able to write. And this is a good example of that. Now, the next album came out in 1978, and that's called MIU, and that stands for Maharishi International University. Now, they took a very different track on this album and recorded this in Iowa. And the reason they recorded it so far away from home was they were trying to get away from the drug scene of L.A. And by this time, Carl was really deep into cocaine. Dennis was also using drugs regularly, as was Brian. So they did this, this album in the Midwest. Carl and Dennis didn't really participate too much. Dennis was working on his solo album, Pacific Ocean Blue. And uh, this album didn't go very well because there wasn't a lot of input from the whole band. Now this album has a very nice late 70s sound and it was produced by Al Jardine. The match point of our love. Early in the game when you broke me just like a search Now that I have lost my diet there's no plan Now, Brian's bodyguard and cousin Stan Love said of these recordings as torture. He added that Wilson did not want to produce his bandmates because he resented them personally. In particular, Brian didn't want to write with Mike anymore. So in 1995, he, Brian was interviewed, and he didn't remember recording this album at all. So he was in pretty bad shape. And the reviews were negative, and um, fans consider it one of the weakest albums. I don't really see this much worse than the three prior albums, but that's just me. MIU was the final album for Reprise, and Warner Brothers Reprise was pretty much done with the Beach Boys. They were not going to renew their contract. So the Beach Boys knew they had to get a new record deal on the table. And this was a really rough time for the band because Dennis quit the band, and it looked like the band was even finished right as they signed were signing with CBS. So this is the worst way you can sign with a label, right when you're, all this discord is going on. And what they ended up doing is they got back together and decided to remain as a band. And they set up, a, the way they set up the band was very interesting because Brian Wilson no longer was going to vote on matters. He gave his vote to Mike Love. So Mike Love and Al Jardine always kind of were on one side and Carl and Dennis on the other. Well, this now made... Uh, Al and Mike able to outvote the two brothers on, and, and really anything that they were tied on. So that was a very strange thing to, to go into. You wouldn't think Brian would do that, but that's how they set it up. So they ended up signing with CBS, and Steve Love arranged this. So he was, he, he was earning his pay, basically, and he signed an $8 million deal with CBS in March 1977. But there were some stipulations that came along with this. And that was it, that Brian was required to write at least four songs per album, co-write at least 70% of all tracks, and produce or co-produce along with his brothers. 
So within weeks of signing the CBS deal, Steve Love was fired by the band. And one of the reasons given was because him and another bodyguard, Rocky Pamplin, punch Carl over issues of giving Brian drugs. So this was an issue um, within the band is trying to keep drugs away from certain band members, mainly the Wilson brothers. And this, this got very physical actually. Now with Steve Love getting fired, they hired a friend of Carl's named Henry Lazarus. Now he was from the entertainment business, but he had no, he had no experience managing a band and nothing in the music industry at all. So he had arranged a European tour, but failed to get the proper paperwork needed to execute concerts. So all these European tours ended up getting canceled. He was fired and Steve Love was brought back in. So you can see these guys didn't know what they were doing at all. Hired all the wrong people. Uh, the losses that they incurred during these, uh, these concerts that were canceled were $200,000 to $500,000. And it just was a mess. Now one of the concerts uh, around this time was at Wembley. And it's notable for uh, an altercation on stage where Mike Love threw a piano bench at Brian in front of 15,000 people. So this is the kind of stuff that was going on with these guys. Another time, uh, Dennis Wilson reportedly threw a, a drum on top of Mike Love. So this all, all happened during the shows. So this could not have been good. And I, I don't understand how the fans stuck with them through all this. And Brian continued to decline during this period. And Dennis's way of trying to coax Brian to writing more songs was to feed him hamburgers and alcohol and drugs, like a hamburger for every song. That's how bad it got. So with the band falling apart, Brian ended up running away from home and he had overdosed on a combination of drugs. And they ended up finding him hitchhiking in West Hollywood, ultimately arriving at a gay bar where he played piano for drinks. After this, he was driven to Mexico by a bar patron and then hitch hitchhiked to San Diego Days later, police officers discovered Wilson lying under a tree in Balboa Park without shoes, money, or a wallet. They promptly took him to Alvarado Hospital for detox from alcohol poisoning. So Brian was almost killing himself here. Carl was also overweight and addicted, and he made a public apology after uh, drunkenly collapsing on stage in Perth. Now, he and his wife, Annie, also divorced. They had been married th since 69, and she stated that, you know, it was the drug problem. You know, when he's talking to his drug dealers more than he's talking to his family and friends, you know there's a problem. That wasn't the only marriage to break up. Dennis Wilson, who had married Karen Lamb, he married her, divorced her, remarried her, and after that remarriage, divorced, filed for divorce two weeks after. So <laughs> that was a mess. And then finally, old, good old Marilyn, who had stuck with Brian all these years, finally had enough as well. The final straw was when Brian offered their daughter Kearney drugs, and that's when she filed for divorce. In November 78, Brian spent several months institutionalized, so he was no longer under the protection of his wife and family and was pretty much on his own. So this was the state of the band when they signed with CBS and was about to do their first album. And guess what? They missed the deadline. So the uh, president of CBS summoned the band to the headquarters and had a little sit down with them. And this is with Walter Yetkinoff. And he was not pleased. He said, I think I've been effed, is what he said. And it was silent. And the whole band is there and Brian chips in. He says, well, Mr. Yetnikoff, I've got some ideas for some new songs. I want to record them in Miami. Yetnikoff said, I'll be down there in two weeks. Let's hear these songs. This reminds me of like Leave it to Beaver in the principal's office. Like, oh, Mr. Yetnikoff, I got some songs for you, but I can't do them on a count. I'm too screwed up on drugs, you know? It's just like Leave it to Beaver. And you have what? Carl is Larry Mondello. Al Jardine could be Whitey. We have uh, Mike Love would make a great Eddie Haskell, right? So this is like, it's like children. These are grown men that can't get an album together. There's, their lives are so messed up that the president has to call them in the office and give them a talking to and is going to go check in on them in two weeks. So two weeks goes by and the president goes down and they've got nothing usable. <laughs> I mean, they got nothing. So they end up basically convincing them to bring back a producer and they bring back Bruce Johnston and they reinstate him full-time into the band, and he's gonna produce this album, and CBS okays this. Now, Bruce had written the song, I Write the Songs by Barry Manilow, so he, he's had a big hit, he's done some production, so he's done well, apart from the Beach Boys, and I think they felt comfortable with him because they had worked with him for so long. Now, this next album, L.A. Light, 
This is one of the songs that they did on the album. It's kind of a remake of an old song called Here Comes the Night. This is a disco remake. The band jumped on the disco bandwagon like right at the end. I mean, they had a number of years to do this. <laughs> you know, this shows how irrelevant they were musically. And this was in uh, 1979. And that song did get up to number 44 in the U.S. charts, 37 in the U.K. And um, one of the things that they had to do for this album was because they didn't have any strong material is they had to bring a couple of Dennis's solo tracks he was working on just to beef up the album. The next album, Keeping the Summer Alive, did a little bit better, but by this time they were barely keeping themselves alive. And 80 to 82 was a period where Brian Wilson, he started to, to fall back into even worse shape as he started eating four or five steaks a day. He was eating copious amounts of ice cream, cookies, and cakes. And at the end of the year, his weight exceeded 340 pounds. He was still smoking four packs a day. He was also increasingly afraid of the water, was starting to avoid showering. He was living by himself. He, well, he had a nurse helping to take care of him, but the band thought that the, the Brian was going to die. So they did the unthinkable, which was bring back Dr. Eugene Landy. And they basically said to Brian, if you don't go with Landy and get yourself cleaned up, you're no longer a beach boy. And they basically fired him until he could get his act together a bit. And this scared him enough to actually want to use Landy again, because Brian was afraid of Landy. Brian was actually fired November 5th of 1982, and this is when Landy's program began right in about early 1983. So Landy immediately started getting results, and he had a lot more, I think Landy entered this situation here with a lot more power, because Marilyn wasn't around anymore, he ran the whole show. And Brian lost over 100 pounds in six months, and Landy pronounced him well enough to perform. Brian was getting the headlines at this point. He made the newspaper for being overweight. Again, this was not good PR for the band. But Dennis was also going through a really hard time. He was practically homeless at this time. His health was also declining throughout the last few years. Why do you think that you've had such you know, continued popularity? Dennis. <laughs> Dennis. <laughs> Good morning, Dennis. I know it's early there. <laughs> Dennis, how you doing? Out, how you doing out there? We keeping you awake? I'm borrowing my brother Carl's microphone. <laughs> I think that is this ABC. Yeah. <laughs> you need a new mic. Dennis was offered the same ultimatum that Brian was, and if he didn't clean up, that he was going to be out of the band. And uh, you can hear like his speaking voice was already pretty much gone, so he was in really bad shape. And this was just from years of abuse. If you knew what it felt like to be up here singing and playing, you know. And the original Beach Boys played their last show on July 4th, 1983. Things in 1983 ended very badly with the death of Dennis Wilson uh, from drowning. And he ended up, uh, I think, drowning accidentally. I think he hit his head uh, maybe coming up. So um, that was um, the end of Dennis. By 1984, Brian was diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic and manic depressive. Doctors also found brain damage from the years of drug use. So this was in 84, so really he, Brian started using drugs in about 1964, for, so for 20 years, it really took its toll on him mentally, physically, and creatively. And uh, unfortunately, there, you've heard all this stuff that Brian was getting into and being found with no wallet and singing for drinks and gay bars and all this stuff. Somehow there are Beach Boy fans out there who think this is all Mike Love's fault for some reason. So that's, why the, well, that's one of the re reasons Beach Boy fans aren't taken as seriously in this day and age because of some of these huge biases they have. It's clear that Brian Wilson was a troubled guy and that he, he abused his body and medicated uh, for years, and I don't know how you can blame somebody else for one's own addiction. But to his credit, and to Landy's credit to a large degree, 
Brian Wilson got back on track and got in very good shape. And the problem was is that Landy became the father figure and could manipulate Brian and did so also enticing Brian to have him in his will. He was the prime beneficiary. He started to write songs with Brian. He started to produce with Brian. He started to sing backing vocals to Brian's songs. So that's a, that's a psychiatrist that is uh, taking it a little too far. And he did lose his license over this. Now, while all this was going on, the Beach Boys had a surprise number one song. Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, I wanna take you because the, the brothers and cousins and family did get involved and wrestled Landy away from Brian. And once that was done, there was a, uh, an effort to get control of their song catalog back. And this had to be done through litigation. And remember, I was saying this way back in 1965, Mike Love's going, well, why? I help write these songs. Why can't I get any of my publishing on this? It took to the early 90s for Love to get the publishing. And to do so, he had to, fight, or he had to sue Brian. So all this stuff had to be done through the courts and it finally got straightened out after all these years. Now the Beach Boys continued on the nostalgia circuit for many years and things uh, took another turn in 1998 when Carl Wilson died of cancer. So that effectively ended a lot of the spirit of the Beach Boys with two brothers gone. And uh, they still, the Beach Boys still toured after that. And it wasn't quite the same, but I, I was able to see them in their 50th anniversary tour back in I believe it was 2012 and that included David Marks and Brian, and it was a really great show, and it was, I was glad to see that. So that is my series on the Beach Boys. Thank you for watching. This was a really fun series to do. It took me, I, I worked on it for probably about two years, and uh, thank you for your patience and um, waiting for me to get these completed. And uh, I really enjoy doing these band histories. There's many more coming this year. And if you like the work I do, I have a Patreon subscription that I'll put below that if you want to support this channel in a bigger way. I've got other things you can uh, support me with. There's merchandise available. And uh, we'll have more things coming in 2024 and beyond. So stay tuned to Pop Goes the 60s.